hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Antoly Kmetyuk, and uh, today I'm going to give this uh, brief talk about uh, the theory of constraints and how I apply it in programming. Now, first of all, I would like to notice the following thing. Uh, in this talk, there will be uh, no scala, like no scala at all. So just this is just forewarning, and this is because I uh, found uh, I am trying to look at programming and software engineering. Uh, from a more interdependent perspective. So this means that this theory of constraints is uh, some approach to programming that I applied more for um, project analysis and management, uh, so that uh, to show how it uh, simplifies life for the programmer. Uh, so uh, the structure of the talk will be as follows. First of all, I will explain uh, what is the theory of constraints, where does it come from, and why uh, I found it useful in programming in the first place, because it is uh, a theory that originates not really in a technical environment. And after that, I'll uh, showcase briefly a small project, uh, a real-world project in which I actually applied this theory. So the theory of constraints, what is it? So the theory of constraints actually originates in a business environment. It originated in uh, the 20th century, at the end of 20th century, in the environment of large American corporations. And it was developed by Eliyahu Goldratt. Eliyahu Goldratt is a physicist by education. Uh, so, and the purpose of the theory was how to manage complexity during production processes uh, on large plants. So the situations uh, that uh, this theory was supposed to address is, for example, when you have a production chain, and uh, well, the production chain uh, consists of multiple steps during which some work is performed. There is input for each stage, there is an output for each stage, and uh, uh, this creates naturally a dependency between states since the input of one stage is fed to another state stage. This theory was popular, popu popularized uh, in his book called The Goal, uh, published in 1984. And uh, the main purpose of this theory of constraints was to identify the root cause of problems that appear on this um, uh, kind of projects. So the, prob the problems precisely uh, would be, for example, malfunctioning or uh, failure to deliver the production at the specified rate. Uh, now, why is that related to programming in general at all? Well, this is because in the decades followed by the, uh, by the development of this theory, uh, naturally this theory got extended to all the complex systems. So Eliyahu Goldratt, being a physicist by education, tried to extend the theory that worked in uh, during his uh, uh, endeavors in the business environment, tried to extend the theory to all the complex environments, and by complex environments, I mean environments with multiple interdependencies, and often nonlinear inter interdependencies, so that the uh, result of one component of the system, the one component of the system influences the performance of another component of the system. Uh, so, what exactly is the theory of constraints? Eliyahu Goldratt, in this nice uh, talk that he gave, uh, says that it is possible to derive the entire theory of constraints from the word focus. So, what does it mean? Uh, in this talk, he says that um, he defines focus as things that need to be done and, thi and um, well, do things that need to be done and do not do things that do not need to be done. Uh, Probably most of you are familiar with uh, the Pareto principle, which says that 80% uh, of your efforts yield, uh, uh, well, 20% of your efforts yield 80% of your results. So this principle is uh, applicable also in uh, in any endeavors, uh, also in programming, but in complex systems, it turns out that this principle is uh, not valid. What is valid in uh, complex systems um, is the rule 99 to 1. So 1% uh, 1 of your efforts yield 99% of your results. And by complex systems, I mean systems with uh, multiple nonlinear interdependencies. So that the, multi the stages of, the, of your production, for example, or the project management cycles are interdependent. Um, and uh, naturally, this means that 
uh, logically from this Pareto principle, it follows that the local optimum does not equal to global optimum. So this means that if your project has multiple stages of execution, uh, you shouldn't try to optimize all of the stages at the same time. Instead, you should be trying to uh, focus on that 1% that will yield maximum result for your effort. Because in the complex systems, if you invest your efforts in the uh, wrong thing, in the thing that is uh, not that 1% that uh, you should be focusing on, you can actually do the harm, do harm because of the interdependencies of uh, 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 of your, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, okay. So, uh, since we have five minutes more, uh, well, let us go to uh, the more practical demonstrations of this theory. So, uh, the theory is actually all about finding the root causes of your uh, problems, and uh, here is one of the techniques that this theory employs for analysis of. Uh, problems that uh, take place. So, for example, imagine that you have multiple problems in your car. For example, its engine doesn't start, and air conditioning is not working, and radio sounds uh, ra radio sounds distorted. And if you are starting to ask yourself the why questions about why these problems occur, you might find that the reason actually might be that the car is in the swimming pool, uh, and uh, this is the root reason of your. Uh, problem. Now, in this uh, example, it is an, uh, quite an obvious reason. However, in the complex projects, it is not as obvious to identify the root reason, and m you might be focusing on uh, uh, on uh, removing the so-called undesirable effects, or UDEs, the top level of the tree, uh, when you should be fixing the root cause of the problem. So the gist of this slide is whenever you have something, uh, some undesirable effects in your program, in your uh, project, you should be asking the why question to identify the root cause of this problem. So briefly, what is the practical experience uh, of uh, mine applying this theory? Basically, recently I worked on a problem uh, requiring uh, me develop, uh, to develop three web applications for a security educational startup, so hence 50 security challenges requiring a showcase. And this resulted in 80 Git branches uh, needing synchronization, so basically multiple moving parts, a complicated environment, complex environment, uh, in the sense that one branch influenced 80 other branches. In this sense, it is complicated. So during this project, I found out that the most of the challenge was not actually programming in Scala, but identifying the root causes of, uh, of the problems that I experienced. And these uh, problems, for example, included how to make sense of the complex environment say, that I am in precisely, what are the security challenges, how do I implement them in the context of the web application, also how to synchronize one branch into the other 80 branches without, uh, without um, uh, having headache without losing time. The solutions to these constraints that I found were, were not programming related. Although it was a Scala uh, project, I spent more time mind mapping, mind mapping and bar scripting than uh, doing actually Scala programming. Well, not really more time, but it saved a lot of time, a lot of time on the organizational issues. And to finalize this presentation, because we are out of time. Uh, I would like to make some parallels uh, with uh, functional programming because um, uh, in, my, uh, in, my, in my point of view, currently the functional programming suffers from the problems that we are focusing on the solution rather than the problem that this solution solves. And this results, for example, in threads like can someone explain to me the benefits of I.O. getting 184 comments. It is indicative that people uh, do not really understand, do not really have a deep understanding of I.O., or at least there are no uh, pre-existing tutorials or materials where they can easily get this understanding. So, hence also the effect of the monadic tutorial fallacy, where people try to uh, manufacture the uh, tutorials in terms of what is a monad, in terms of what, uh, or instead of uh, trying to explain what uh, problem does it solve, and uh, this obviously results in a fallacy because nobody understands uh, this kind of tutorials. And, well, to wrap it up, why functional programming is not a, si a silver bullet? Well, in first of all, I'd like to say that in many cases it is, because it is a very powerful programming technique. However, 
uh, before applying it, you should really be trying to understand your problem and whether functional programming is really a solution to it. So trying to restart the engine makes little sense if you haven't pulled the car out of the swimming pool first. So first understand the problem, then apply the techniques what you're, what you, uh, that you're trying to apply. Basically, that, that is the message. Focus on the problem and not the solutions. So, well, thank you for your attention. Okay.